Hi Founder fans, Jason here. Welcome to Founder of the Day Trivia. It's Thursday. What a good time we are prepared to have. As always, my hair is all over the place, but that's okay. We're going to have fun. Let me know you're here in the comments, uh, and then we will do that trivia, as they say. I would like to... I uh, would like you guys to let me know you're here. I'll fix my mic real quick. A little disheveled. Of course, ran down for a glass of water at the last minute because I always forget something. And today was to bring myself some water. I don't want to run into what we ran into last week where I could barely breathe. Let's continue. So to start tonight, we are going to pop up, do a little bit of a study hall, as I like to call it. A little bit of a, 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 a get to know you as we get going. If you want to hit like on your way in, that would be fantastic. Uh, I am going to change the time right over here real quick. Uh, anyone popping in, let me know you're here so that uh, I know we can start trivia. Now, uh, let's see, go to countdown trivia. We're gonna put up five minutes. We're gonna do a little bit of a, we're gonna do five minutes, see if I can do five founders in five minutes while we get ready. As people roll in, give those of you who are prompt something to learn about, uh, and wink, wink, these are probably gonna have something to do with the questions we run into a little in just four minutes and 46 seconds. So, as I said, let me know you're here. Uh, get ready. Any questions? Now it's time to ask them. Uh, any readings or videos we had this week? Uh, let me know. First off, uh, you Williamson, I discussed him in the live Patreon event. If you want to watch live, definitely subscribe to the Patreon. And I uh, released a, that clip, pretty lengthy one, about this man's career earlier this week in super short. Physician from Philadelphia uh, goes to Europe to or England to raise money for education in Philadelphia on his way he stops in Boston to catch his boat and happens to see a tea party goes over to Europe is a leading American there again uh, for the resistance comes back to North America uh, helps smuggle medicine through the British blockade to help the Patriots and the Continental Army soon thereafter heads over to uh, uh, serves as a surgeon in the army for a little bit ends up becoming a North Carolina representative in the Continental Congress, runs over from there, signs the United States Constitution, uh, ends up being an inaugural member of the United States House of Representatives. So, you, Williamson, a fascinating founder. Again, if you want more on that, check out the video I released earlier this week. Mad Ann Bailey. Now, I've seen her name spelled two ways, with and without the E. That's not important. Mad Ann Bailey is really well known as a frontier woman who... Did some incredible things. Mostly she was on horseback for several decades, riding around the middle part of North America, uh, jumping to and fro and becoming most famous for a ride uh, to during the Northwest Indian War. Actually, though, she did serve during the Revolutionary War um, as a courier and a scout. Uh, she got the respect of the Native Americans because they heard her screaming. Uh, they stole her horse one time. She took it back in the middle of the night in the dark and they heard her uh, shrieking as she rode away. So they were afraid of her and wouldn't attack her during her rides. Uh, eventually Fort Lee, uh, which I'm not entirely sure the exact location because there were several Fort Lees, uh, but she rides over 100 miles to tell the neighboring fort that Fort Lee was in trouble, brings back arms and ammunition and men to protect the soldiers over there. Eliza Pinckney. Now, I am going to do another video this week on the Pinckney family. I'm going to do a family tree this weekend on uh, the Pinckney family. Uh, I'll do it over, as I said, on the Patreon for the live. For the Patriots, if you want to watch live and ask questions, head over there on Sunday night, but I'll release it early next week for the rest of you. Uh, Eliza Pinckney was the mother of two gentlemen who would later run for vice president alongside John Adams. Uh, neither of them would win, <laughs> but uh, she is really important. And anyone popping in, let me know you're here for trivia. We're just doing a little bit of a roundup, two minutes till trivia. Uh, going through some of the founders of the week. Eliza Pinckney, uh, she, her husband was away for a while and she ends up uh, uh, proving that you could grow indigo in South Carolina, which became extremely important, making her, and she became one of the most important early business women, women in South Carolina for quite some time. Uh, while this brought a lot of wealth to South Carolina, unfortunately, it also kind of brought more slaves to South Carolina to grow the indigo. Oh, there's always good and with the bat. Anyway, uh, she, as I said, had two sons who would run for president. Uh, okay, uh, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, a signer of the United States Constitution, would run as vice president with John Adams uh, when Thomas Jefferson from the other party becomes vice president in uh, 96. Uh, and then his brother Thomas would run as first is John Adams' vice presidential candidate, and then 
uh, would twice run Thomas, um, John, uh, Thomas Pinckney would twice run for president of the United States, losing both times to Jefferson and then Madison. Uh, running through these founders, William Parkner, Parker, kind of a really random person, but he was a uh, treasurer of South Carolina. He's most known for when the British came and took Charleston, he escaped with the papers of South Carolina. He also, at one point, tells the Continental Congress that he just kind of finds uh, $402,000 that he believed belonged to Georgia, but they couldn't figure out what to do with it or where it came from in the mayhem of evacuating Savannah. So those people, many evacuated to Charleston and then Parker evacuated with all their stuff. And last but not least, Nicholas Gilman. Nicholas Gilman from the Gilman family of North Carolina, trying to squeeze five pounders in five minutes here before trivia. Uh, Gilman family of North Carolina runs over, joins uh, under Alexander Scammell, serves as adjutant general of the Continental Army. Uh, Scam, uh, I'm sorry, adjutant general of Scammell's 3rd New Hampshire Division. Scammell then becomes adjutant general of the Continental Army, and Gilman becomes his deputy adjutant general of the Continental Army, helping adjutant general does the administration administrating I know I'm out of time administrating of the uh, war itself he would later go on to join the Continental Congress uh the Continental Congress uh, he would join the Continental Congress but then go to the Constitutional Convention as it says next to me signed the United States Constitution uh then becomes an inaugural member of the United States House of Representatives slowly transforms his beliefs from a federalist when the government first meets to a Democratic Republican by the time he runs for Senate in 1801. He loses, but then in 1804 wins, spends 10 years there. Uh, I forgot. There was a question I meant to ask, uh, and I forgot to type it in. Uh, what brothers, what members of the House of Representatives had a brother that was a governor at the same time? Uh, Nicholas Gilman's brother, whose first name escapes me, was governor of New Hampshire while he was in Congress at the same time. Uh, I believe, the reason I didn't put it up, I forgot to look it up. Uh, I believe John Sullivan, after signing the Constitution, I, I don't remember if he becomes in a House, a member of the House of Representatives or a Continental Congress, uh, member of the House of Representatives or the United States Senate, but at the same time he was in the federal government, his brother was governor of Massachusetts. And that is that. Let's get over to trivia. Now, no one's told me they're here yet. And I got trivia to do. <laughs> I guess I'll continue. I guess I'll start asking because I know some people are popping in, hanging out, but no one's let me know they're here to actually play the trivia, which is strange because several of you have come in. Some of you have even hit like. So I guess we'll just get through it. <laughs> um, that being said, I'm going to fix my clock over here. As I do that, there is a question on the screen. Anyone wants to answer it? Which Constitution signer was at the Boston Tea Party 14 years earlier? A big hint. I just gave you his name. Well, not just gave you his name necessarily. Just talk about Nicholas Gilman. That might not be the correct answer. Uh, probably not, if you can't tell from my hint. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Let's see. I am pulling this up. I'm going to change this to... Where are we at here? Timer for games. There it is. Whammy. I'll bring that down to one minute, because it's a normal question. And here we go. And I guess I'll stall. Anyone popping in? We just did a little bit of a wrap-up. This is the first question, and times are running. Now, let me know you're here. As I've been repeating, for anyone watching in the future, I know some people would like to watch back, uh, I will keep talking for you. Uh, there was a signer of the Constitution at the Boston Tea Party 14 years earlier, but it was not a resident of Boston. It was a gentleman who just happened to be passing through. People apparently love to watch this. I guess you guys like to watch me squirm because <laughs> there's a bunch of people watching right now who just apparently, even if you don't know the answer, you know, just say hi. Come on. <laughs> don't leave me hanging. I've been doing trivia for a long time and this is the second week. You guys are kind of leaving me hanging to get started. I'm, I'm a little nervous here, a little sweaty. That was, that was me doing our Rodney Dangerfield. And as time runs out, I suppose I will simply give you the question. I know what the answer is. It is... You Williamson, just a fascinating guy. I've brought up you Williamson several times over the course of this week. I put out a video about him. He's just uh, a really fascinating character. He plays a little bit of role in all sorts of different things. Goes on to sign the United States Constitution. So with that, I guess I'll take a sip of water because here we are. Stalling. <laughs> I also bought a soda today because I didn't want to have coffee too late. I don't usually drink soda, but I did it. Nick. 
There it is. Someone's coming in. Well, Nick, you're the only one hanging out right now. You're the only one giving me answers. So here we go. What did you, Williamson, smuggle into the United States to help the Continental Army? What do you think, Nick? We were just talking about you, Williamson. He's kind of the man of the week this week. Now, I will note that he what he was smuggling didn't just help the Continental Army. It actually helped the militias, primarily the North and South Carolina militias, uh, where he was importing from and with whom he was working closest. And uh, it helped the people, helped people at large who needed this particular item or set of items or products that he was importing. Nick, give me a guess. Let's hear it. See what you guess. I'm waiting. Pressure's on, bud. Pressure's on. That's what happens when you're, all, you're the only punctual one who's actually here to answer the questions. Anyone just popping in? We're only on question number two, and we're waiting for an answer. We're waiting for an answer. What did you, Williamson, smuggle into the United States to help the Continental Army and the people in general? Oh, no, that's not an answer. Drugs. Nick, uh, drugs is not an incorrect answer. It's not exactly right, but it's not wrong. Medicine. He smuggled medicine in uh, through the British blockade. Hey, Grey Wheels, just in time. Just just question number two. You just missed the U. Williamson questions. Great guy. We've been talking about him all week. All right, question number the third. What was Mad Ann Bailey best known for? I will accept how she got her name, but that is a lengthy story. Actually, you know what? Tell me what she's best known for I'll tell you while I tell you the story about how she got the name Mad Ann. And she got the name for several reasons, but she was being chased by Native Americans, the Shawnee at one point, because she was a patriot and they were not. She bails on her horse and goes and hides in a log. And the Shawnee men can't find her. They get her horse, but they even sit on the log she's in and can't find her. They bring the horse back to their camp and they go to sleep. And sneaks in at night takes her horse and leaves and when she's just far enough away not to get caught she starts shrieking and hollering and screaming in the distance scaring the life out of the shawnee men who awoke from their slumber they decide uh to i'm gonna move my phone so it doesn't bother you guys again uh they decide that she is a ghost or something and cannot be killed and therefore they do not attack her again while she's time's up making her very long ride she was a courier and a scout for the Continental Army out on the Western Frontier. Uh, she is most famous for a 100-mile ride uh, to warn a neighboring fort that Fort Lee was under attack. Uh, and she helps get uh, men and munitions there in time to save the day. Nick and Gray Wheels, no answers. Let's go to the next query. What did both of Eliza Pinckney's sons do with John Adams? Uh, scout is not wrong. Uh, she didn't particularly scout for gunpowder. Uh, Nick, she scouted for... She was basically mostly a courier. She would ride up and down the the frontier. Thousands, arguably thousands of miles throughout her decades-long career. Running up and down. Uh, and so when she would see something, she'd say something, basically. Uh, she wasn't really an official scout, but... Uh, I'm sure if she saw powder, she would have let people know. Although there wasn't a ton of powder just hanging around on the frontier. As for this question, Eliza Pinckney, as we said, the woman who, re who proved that you could grow indigo in South Carolina, which was both great for economic purposes and terrible for the increase in slavery in the Carolinas' purposes. But uh, both of her sons were really important founders. One ends up signing the Constitution with his cousin who had a very similar name uh both of her sons are diplomats go overseas for the americans during the washington and adams administrations uh and time's up no guesses no guesses at what the pink knees did with john adams i'm gonna reveal it as no it's really guessing today they ran against him gray wheels quite the opposite they ran with him uh, Charles Coatsworth in 1796 was John Adams' vice presidential candidate, and four years later in 1800, his brother Thomas Pinckney was, jo again, John Adams' vice presidential candidate. Now, what's really interesting about Charles Coatsworth is uh, in the 1796 election, of course, John Adams won, and then his opponent, Thomas Jefferson, came in second and became vice president, fairly famously, which makes Charles Coatsworth Pinckney really the only vice presidential candidate 
I believe in history, who ran with the person and that person became president, but they did not become vice president. It was a winning president on the ticket and a losing vice president. Poor Charles C. Pinkney. And it's Pinkney like the color. I always say Pinkney. I apologize if I let that slip on accident. So they ran with him. And then Thomas Pinkney, who lost, uh, uh, who ran in 1800 when John Adams lost to Jefferson and Burr, Thomas would then be the Federalist candidate for president in 1804 and 1808, losing to Jefferson and Madison, respectively. And his loss to Thomas Jefferson in 1804 is still the most dramatic loss in presidential history. Sorry, Pinckney's. They were hugely important to the war, though. Uh, several member, um, um, some members of that family were governor of South Carolina, uh, both important diplomats, uh, uh, Charles Coatsworth, I believe, was is the one who went to Spain for a while. Uh, I think Thomas was the one who replaced John Adams as second minister to Great Britain. Just a hugely important family. Like I said, I'm going to be doing a family tree uh, this Sunday over on the Patreon page. If you want to support the channel and see a lot of the live videos on Sunday, uh, join that. But I will clip it, don't worry, and release it to everyone because it's important, fun information everyone should know. Oh, also, I'm going to be doing a live video on, let's say, Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, either tomorrow or Saturday. I haven't made up my mind yet. You know what? Why don't we do it tomorrow? I will be doing a live video tomorrow uh, where we're counting down the top most underrated or underappreciated revolutionaries from Massachusetts. So, you guys, hit that notification bell so you know when I go live tomorrow. Question number the fifth. Whose surname is alphabetically last on the Declaration of Independence? AKA, last names, whose last name, what signer of the declaration, their last name is alphabetically last. For example, Adams is a wrong answer because alphabetically that last name is first. Whose last name is last? I'll give you a minute, I'll give you a minute. I am sipping on soda. This is not something I usually do, but I didn't want to have a coffee at this hour. I need a little bit of energy. Uh, and it is Cherry Pepsi, so not sponsored. <laughs> Nick, coming at us with Williams. Williams is a great answer. As we said last week, uh, the most common first letter of a last name on the declaration is H. The second most common is W. Williams is a great answer. Can anyone come up with another answer that's after that? I'm not saying there is one. That could be the right answer. But we have 25 seconds left, and boy, do we want everyone to play Gray Wheels. Come on, throw us an answer. Give us a guess. It's a fun time. If you're wrong, it's the internet. You're anonymous. No one cares. <laughs> I, the only one who cares is me, and I only care that you're having fun and playing along. There are several people who seem to watch every week who don't play along, and you know what? I wanted to give them an extra special sh shout out. Thank you for watching. I hope you're having a good time uh, watching me squirm. <laughs> um, and the answer is with. The answer is with. Not wife. I used to pronounce it wrong, and boy, did I get a lot of trash talk on that video. It's with. Speaking of the Declaration of Independence, well, I guess it's time we come over here and play a game. Yeah, a game for the signers of the Declaration of Independence. I am going to put this one up. Last week, we did two sets of five minutes and didn't quite make it. I'm going to put ten minutes on the clock. Guys, give me the last name. Give me a name. You... you Excuse me, shouldn't have had, shouldn't have had soda. <laughs> okay, we learned a lesson. Nick, Great Wheels, anyone else watching? You got 10 minutes. Can you name signers of the declaration? Nick already named one. And you know what? I will actually, I will pop that out there because Williams. Williams is actually the third to last, if I'm paying attention correctly. Oh, no, no. Fourth, fourth to last. Uh, we'll let you know. Jefferson, okay, Nick. Okay, Nick with Adams. We got two Adamses. Uh, we got a Jefferson. There is a Tommy J. Absolutely, Gray Wheels. There certainly is. What are the names? You guys come up with any names? Gray Wheels with Floyd. William Floyd from my old stomping ground on Long Island. Yes. The only founder from New York whose house still currently stands. And I used to give tours at that particular location. Absolutely loved it. Yes. 
Mr. Hart, John Hart, cave dweller. After he signed the Declaration of Independence, uh, the British came to his home and he ran and hid in a cave for several days because, you know, didn't want to get caught. <laughs> so I like to call him the cave dweller of the American Revolution. Though he didn't really live in it. It wasn't really like he chose to live in a cave. Now, guys, I know for a fact there's at least one name you know. One of the big six, as I like to call them, is still available for saying over here. I know, I'm, I should put my, I know, I'm supposed to put the comments on this side of my screen so that I'm looking this way and it looks like I'm looking at the screen, but the way I'm set up, it would be behind my light. I don't want to do it. Hancock, Hancock is a correct answer, not the person I thought, definitely not one of the big six, not nearly as important as his big signature in, uh, uh, might recommend his name. He's one of those founders who like, who's very important. Don't get me wrong. But, uh, his stature is, is a lot larger because people remember his name, uh, compared to others. Uh, gray wheels. Lewis is a correct answer. Uh, Francis Lewis, father of Morgan Lewis and his wife, Elizabeth Lewis has a fascinating story too. There is another Lewis. That's a first name. Let's see if you can get that. Uh, Franklin, there he is, Nick, there's the big six, uh, the big six, of course, now that we've gotten all of the ones on this list are, in my opinion, Franklin, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Hamilton, in no particular order. Franklin, we got a read, do we got a read, I hear a read, do we get a read, there's a read, we got a Rodney, now they're coming in, now they're coming in, a Rodney, yes, absolutely, there's a Caesar named Rodney, Rush. Dr. Benjamin Rush, he definitely inked his name on that document. Now we're playing, now we're playing Livingston. Yes, just one Livingston, Philip Livingston, his brother, uh, William, voted for independence and then left to go be governor of New Jersey before he had a chance to sign. And his cousin, Robert R. Livingston, voted for independence and served on the Committee of Five that wrote the Declaration of Independence, but also left before it was time to sign to become Chancellor of New York State. Oh, look at that, Nick paying attention with the last name alphabetically thank you harrison yes my son's friend's name i uh, just had game day with his father this afternoon where is he there he is alphabetically we got it gwinnett button gwinnett with the most the third most expensive signature in the entire world i believe it's after caesar and cleopatra uh because he died in a duel so quickly after signing that document and people want to collect the document. There are only 39 known signatures of Button Gwinnett, and therefore there are only possible 39 total collections of autographs of signers of the Declaration. Uh, with uh, Gwinnett's, okay, Payne. Is there a Payne? I believe there's a Payne. Not Thomas Payne. Uh, uh, pa, pa, forget his first name, Payne. Okay, we're going through here. Let me catch up, and then I'll remember Payne. Uh, McKeon, yes. Thomas McKeon. Thornton from New Hampshire. Rutledge, yes. Uh, Thomas Rutledge, I believe it is, uh, who replaced his older brother, John Rutledge, who was a hugely important founder. Sherman, yes. Roger Sherman signed everything. Absolutely. Carroll. I will give you Carroll. Yes, it's Charles Carroll of Carrollton. <laughs> Great name, Chase. Yes, Chase is on there. Hopkins. Hopkins. Son. Yes. Uh, his hand trembles, does it, but his heart does not. Now, Hopkins' son is a full, very long name that may or may not contain another unrelated name who also signed the document. That's a big old hint right there. Anyone popping in? We're just naming signs of the declaration before we get back to the trivia. If you're here and you want to play along, Throw in some names. Doesn't matter if we already said it. It's worth a shot. See what you know. Uh, Nelson. Yes. Nelson Jr. Where are you? Alphabet. You think it'd be better at doing the alphabet by this point. All right. We got a whole bunch. Let's see. We got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Oh, I scrolled down and messed up. Let's go from the bottom. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25 of 59. Can we get 30? Get at least 50%. I see some names coming in. Hall. Do we do Hall yet? I know there's a, there is a Hall. We did not do it yet. Well played, Nick. Nick, you are doing a really fine job right now. Uh, Gray Wheels also doing well. 
when you decide to chip in, you're always right. So keep it up. Anyone else pop it in? Want to name some founders? Go ahead. Let's see who signed the declaration. Who is it you're aware of? Taylor. Let's see down here. That name's Taylor for sure. I've lost count again. I think we're somewhere around 27 maybe. Lee. Ooh, I want to give you a quiz and say who because there's Francis Lightfoot Lee and Robert Henry Lee. Siblings that signed the Declaration of Independence. That's right. They also had two siblings over in England who ended up being diplomats, important diplomats, although some of them had, Arthur Lee had some questionable uh, conversations there with Silas Dean. Uh, and they would actually be in England and sign a document with the aforementioned U. Williamson that we were discussing before. When U. Williamson went over to England for the first time, he and Benjamin Franklin, the Lee brothers, Ralph Izzard, who also became an important diplomat, they end up uh, leading a charge of patriots in Britain before the war breaks out, uh, trying to stop the the stuff from going down. Uh, Nick, we got a pen. Yes, pen is correct. Uh, not related to the Penn family that I know of. Uh, he was from North Carolina, I believe. Uh, Smith, yes. That one's from Pennsylvania. Paca, that's the guy I forgot to put on last week. Added him live, so that's pretty easy to remember. There's Paca. That's one, two, three last names with, that start with P that we've gotten. Okay, we're doing, we're doing, we're doing. Let's see, let's count them up again. W, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. So we got over that 30 mark. We're more than halfway there. Let's keep it up. Clark is an answer from the great state of New Jersey, not hiding in a cave like uh, uh, Hart, also from New Jersey. Lynch, do we do Lynch? Thomas Lynch Jr. We did not. Fun fact about the Lynches. So Thomas Lynch Sr. was sent to the first Continental Congress, signed the Articles of Association, or the Continental Association as it's usually known. And then he uh, has a stroke and his son, Thomas Jr., ends up uh, being chosen to replace him in the Continental Congress. So Thomas Lynch Jr., uh, Thomas Lynch Sr. was in bed a few blocks away from the Continental Congress when they signed the Declaration of Independence. He was too sick to even come over and sign the document which, if he had, would have made them the only father-son team to have signed the declaration. We were very close to that. Hayward is correct. Where is he? There he is. Uh, Gary. No, you know what? I think that's the first incorrect answer you've thrown out. Oh, wait, no. Except it is. It is a correct answer. Why would I, why would I doubt Elbridge Gary, a true patriot, future vice president, future guy at the Constitutional Convention who said, I'm not going to sign that garbage and bounced. <laughs> One of three people who were there when they signed and watched them sign it and did not. Uh, Ross, yes, there it is. George Ross, for sure. Nick, you are doing really well. A bunch of people watching you do very well. No one wants to participate and help, uh, except for Grey Wheels, who did throw out some correct answers. 39 seconds. Let's count them up. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, Whipple for sure, 38. Look at that, really filling them up, really filling them up. A pseudonym, yes, Morris, Robert Morris, and you know what, I'm going to give you both Morrises, I'm going to give you Lewis Morris, because usually we just throw out the last name here, unrelated, one from the Morris family of uh, New York. Uh, a brother of more famous, probably Governor Morris, uh, who is the penman of the United States Constitution. Great job, guys. Suiting and popping in right there to get number 39 right at the end. That's a pretty good one. And you know what? Nick's still going. And since he said Stockton, yes, father-in-law of Dr. Benjamin Rush, uh, as well as a father-in-law of one of the Pinckneys. I think it's Charles Pinckney, a cousin of the two we were discussing earlier, who both ran for vice president with John Adams unsuccessfully. So, there we go. That's a pretty solid mix. So, who'd we miss? Bartlett. Um, Josiah Bartlett, who, if you ever watched the show, uh, not Law and Order, um, uh, uh, the president show where Estevez's father, Sheen, uh, Sheen plays the president. What is that? 
West Wing. If you ever watch the show The West Wing, uh, uh, not Charles, uh, Martin Sheen plays uh, Josiah Bartlett. And the re they named that character after this particular founder because he's, a, in the show, a former governor of New Hampshire. Uh, so they pretend he's a descendant of this person, which is a super cool shout out to this particular person. Carter Braxton, uh, usually powerful Braxton family. Uh, not as famous, but just as powerful as the Lee family of Virginia. George Clymer, uh, he, I believe, would also sign the Constitution. Uh, Ellery, William Ellery, had just replaced uh, Samuel Ward, who passed away. And he actually sits at the table next to Charles Thompson to watch the faces of the people signing their death warrants. Uh, Joseph Hughes, uh, Hopkins. So someone said Hopkins' son before, and I was like, oh, there's another name in that name. Uh, it's Hopkins. Uh, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. So, okay, so Hopkins' son that you did get was one of like the artist of the founders one of the artists he was like a poet he helped design the flag wanted to get paid in whisk or in a barrel of beer and the founder and the other delegates the constitutional convention said no you're getting paid by your state to be here <laughs> we're not gonna you're already getting paid it's part of your job is to design the american flag uh hopkins son his hand troubles but it's hard to not uh hooper Huntington Middleton, who had just replaced his father, who was at the First Continental Congress, and not as radical. They sent Arthur to replace his dad because they knew he'd sign. Uh, Morton, I always remember the salt for that. Uh, Stone, Walton of Georgia, uh, Witherspoon, president of uh, College of New Jersey, James Wilson, one of the most intelligent men of the founding, an important creator of the Constitution, and a an important proponent of the constitution when ratification came james wilson wink wink james wilson james wilson oliver wolcott don't you know it's insane that's a vampire weekend reference i always make when we do this let's get back to the trivializing that was the last question don't you worry let's go on with another question so what meeting held in new york city in 1765 successfully protested Parliament's taxation policies. Anyone popping in, feel free to offer us a guess. What meeting held in New York City in 1765 successfully protested Parliament's taxation policies? They said no taxation without representation, and Parliament went, okay, we could, but we don't want to anymore. Let me know. I'm going to take a quick sip because I've been talking, 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 talking all day. Again, not sponsored by Pepsi. Couldn't be up all night having a coffee tonight, so I had a little bit of soda. Don't actually like it. Makes my teeth feel yucky. But what are you going to do? Especially because I just brushed my teeth before I came on. So, you know, it's mixed in there with delicious toothpaste flavoring. As time runs down, I see that Nick gave us an answer. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for being cool tonight. Anyone else? Pseudonymous, what is it? Pseudonymous, yeah, pseudonymous account. Uh, pseudonymous, Great Wheels, you still watching, still hanging out? Let us know. Nope, too late, time's up. Yes, it is the Stamp Act Congress, a really important milestone in the build up towards the American Revolution. Uh, the Patriots said no taxation without representation. Parliament said, okay, and they got rid of it. And then they passed the Declaratory Act, which said we can do whatever we want, whenever we want. Just don't get any ideas just because we're doing it this time. Largely, it was the uh, businessmen in England who were saying, hey, they're not buying our stuff anymore. Uh, help us out. And, you know, as always, big business. One, we don't talk about modern politics here, but, you know. <laughs> Okay, next query. This is our not American Revolution question of the day. We like to have fun here and bounce around. True or false? There were still living woolly mammoths when the Great Pyramid of Giza was built. I believe it's pronounced Giza. Great Pyramid in Egypt. When it was built, there were still woolly, woolly mammoths hanging around. It could be true or it might be false. No one knows for sure. That's actually, no, someone knows for sure. It's me. I, that's why I put this question here is because it has been factually proven in one direction or another. And it's, uh, is it a trick question? I don't know. No one knows. I mean, I do know, as I said, but you know, 
stalling for time here while you guys come up with an answer. I will note while we're waiting, we live closer in time to Cleopatra than she lived to the building of the pyramids. Nick coming through. It's an answer. At least it's an answer. There's so many people watching who don't want to play. That's fascinating to me. But okay, great. Glad you guys are having fun. Uh, the answer is true. The last known woolly mammoths were uh, down in the Arctic Circle on an island. I forget the name of the island. But they were still living on an island in the Arctic uh, in as recently somewhere between 4,000 and 3,700 B.C. And that's, they built the pyramid about 4,000 B.C. Which means, like, so Cleopatra lived about year zero. So she, she lived two times closer to us than the actual building of the pyramids. She lived about 4,000 years after the pyramids and only 2,000 years before us. Really blows your mind with the perception of time, which, when we put it like that, means that the American Revolution wasn't all that long ago. You know, like, my great-grandparents lived through World War I, and they're as far from the American founding as they are from us. So. What a good time. <laughs> anyway, let's go. Got a few more questions here. This is a lengthy one. Uh, hopefully you've watched the uh, Federalist read-alongs on Tuesdays, or else this one will be very difficult. Uh, in Federalist number 23, Alexander Hamilton states that the first principle of the federal government is the common defense. What three powers does the government need to achieve these ends? What are the three things the government needs to be able to do to provide for the common defense? Which, again, Hamilton believes is the first principle. I put up, I said principle, excuse me, I said principle purpose here, which is weird because I went and double checked and he says first principle. So I used the same word in a different context. <laughs> he used principle as in first. Uh, I used principle as in first. He used principle as in purpose. Anyway, what is uh, give me some give me the, give, can you name the three things the government needs to do to be able to provide for the common defense time's up it's a tricky one i'll stall for a few more seconds in case you're still typing because it is three things this is a tough question but you know it is an hour's worth of reading through that we do every tuesday if you're interested in learning about the federalist papers make sure you like and subscribe hit that notification bell so you know when i go live on tuesdays uh and the of the uh he said these three things over and over and over again he really drove it home formation yes uh yes it needs to be ratified the constitution but he said these three things number one to raise an army and navy two to control the army and navy and three to raise revenue for these forces as hamilton puts it by any means necessary uh the Army and Navy part is fairly obvious. You need an Army and Navy to provide for defenses, of course. To control these forces, he very much criticized the Articles of Confederation for not being able to control the forces it wanted to raise. You, if you expect the government, in Hamilton's perspective, if you expect the government to defend the nation, you need it to be able to both have an army and be in control of the army. It can't be taking orders from the separate states. It needs to have total control. And it needs to be able to raise money to pay for the army by any means necessary. That is what the founders wanted. As I say during the uh, Federalist Read-Alongs, it's often surprising by a lot of modern Americans how the people who wanted the Constitution really wanted a standing army real bad and wanted the government to be able to find money in any fashion it desired to pay for that army. Let's continue. Um, question number nine. Who was deputy adjutant general of the Continental Army under Alexander Scammell? There were several. So we discussed this person earlier. He's actually today's founder, which is a hint. Uh, there are a bunch of people left when they heard me talking about Alexander Hamilton wanted a standing army. The truth hurts, guys. I apologize. Uh, Alexander Scammell was one of several people who became adjutant general of the Continental Army. Adjutant general is essentially HR representative of an army. 
Uh, I know anyone in the military who hears me say that is laughing about what an idiot I sound like. That's obviously not precisely how it works, but it's the administrative branch of that that organizes the business side of running an army. And this person, the answer to this question was uh, Adjutant General for Scammell's Division of North, 3rd North Carolina Regiment that was first in the North Carolina Militia, then was absorbed into the Continental Army. He uh, then went... Sk- Gamble's unit did such a good job administering that when Alexander became adjutant general, uh, this person, whose name is the correct answer, uh, jo- uh, joins him as the deputy adjutant general of the Continental Army. This is a very difficult question, so I will give it to you. It's Nicholas Gilman, a future signer of the Constitution. Unfortunately, Alexander Scammell dies just before the Battle of Yorktown and some of the preliminary engagements when the siege was just getting underway, which really, from a good many people, the victory of the at Yorktown was fairly soured losing such an important person in Alexander Scammell. In fact, I've run into several founders who named their children Alexander Scammell, blah, blah, blah. We'll insert last name. And here we go. As we close out our happy fun time with our last question. Who gave the State House Yard speech in defense of the Constitution shortly after the document was sent out for ratification? He signed the Constitution, send it out for ratification. There's already anti federalists prepared for a fight. The secret is out. Uh, and very shortly, uh, less than a month later, uh, the answer to this question, a uh, uh, signer of both the Declaration and the Constitution, uh, gets up in the State House yard. The State House being uh, that actually might be two words and not one. Now that I'm looking at it, whoopsie daisy, typed it in wrong. Uh, got up, gave the State House yard speech promoting the Constitution in Pennsylvania, uh, which was one of the first to ratify. Not the first. It's Delaware. They would they would be very mad at me in Delaware if I got that wrong. But um, one of the first. Uh, Nick coming through with an answer. Nick, one of the only people giving answers today. So we don't have to wait 14 seconds to see if anyone else wants to jump in on this last question, Nick. Uh, but uh, thank you for taking the hints I was giving before. <laughs> I was saying how important James Wilson was to ratification. Because yes, the answer is James Wilson. An amazingly important American founder. One of the brightest legal minds of the revolution. Uh, a man who, after signing the Declaration of Independence, found himself in some hot water with patriots, especially drunk patriots who were in the militia, who were not happy that he was defending certain accused loyalists in Philadelphia uh, of to maintain their property. Of course, after, we're going back in time now, but uh, the Patriots start in Philadelphia. The British come and take Philadelphia. They just kind of leave the next year, and the Patriots come back. And the Patriots are not happy with Many of the people who were there when the Patriots were there stayed there when the British were there and then were still there when the Patriots got back. Uh, They had a few essentially show trials. There were, I believe, two people actually executed uh, for siding with the Patriots and helping raise uh, uh, militia and units to join the British. Most of the people who stayed the whole time were very wealthy and both sides wanted them, the wealthy elite in Philadelphia, to be happy when you know, both the Americans and British assumed they would win the war, and both sides wanted the wealthy elite in Philadelphia, then the nation's largest city, to be happy with them. So they pretty much got off scot-free. That being said, some of them were accused by the Continental Congress of treason, and James Wilson defended several of these people to keep their property and not be executed for treason, and a bunch of regular old gentlemen, not even, not gentlemen, regular old dudes who happened to be in the militia and were off duty, went to a bar, got hammered, and said, why is he defending these wealthy elites who didn't fight against the British? Let's go to his house. And they go to his house, and they start kicking in the doors. Uh, there's actually one of Wilson's friends fire shots from the upper window. They try and kick in his doors and burn the house down. And Joseph Reed, who was James Wilson's political enemy, yet sitting governor of Pennsylvania. They called it president at the time, but he was essentially governor. He calls out the militia to suppress these drunken militiamen to protect a signer of the Declaration of Independence. That's a fun story to end on. What do you think, guys? I'm going to pop myself up nice and big here. Look at that. And I'm all blurry because I was in the small screen for so long, but we're going to have to learn to live with that. I also have to move myself over here because when I look at myself, I want to make it look like I'm looking at you. Hi, guys. Anyway, thank you so much for playing. It's about a week and a half since I shaved. This is what it looks like after that much time. We're going to see how long it takes to grow back in, and then we'll see if I shave it again. Uh, Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, do me a favor and hit like.
if you watch this far, the handful of you still here, even if you don't want to participate, hitting like is the best thing you can do because then more people will find out about the channel and more people will come play trivia, come learn about the Federalist Papers, come do all this other fun stuff we're doing over here at Founder of the Day. If you did want to support the channel, definitely check out the link to the Patreon page down below. Uh, every Sunday, I do a live video where we hang out and chit chat. I answer your questions. Uh, I do a little extra something some though i do clip that like i said this week it's going to be the pink d's we're going to put those out it's going to be a lot of fun and uh tomorrow night probably about 8 30 maybe 9 i am going to be doing a countdown of the most underappreciated american revolutionaries from massachusetts so if you're interested in that clear your schedule we're gonna have a party anyway i'm jason uh, i'm gonna get out of here thank you so much for watching and i am your humble and obedient servant